Good morning. Good to see all those of you who have joined in with us for our Tuesday morning Bible class. And we certainly appreciate you taking your time uh, to be with us. Uh, this is a class that we have, uh, we started uh, about a year or so ago. And we have continued uh, um, through this time. We usually go three months on and three months off, you know. And, uh, and of course, before all of this transpired, we were able to meet here at the building and we would have a little luncheon afterwards and good fellowship. Uh, but now uh, we are able to come through uh, the means of, uh, of this, this media. And we just appreciate that. For, certainly appreciate Brother Craig for all that he does and, and in uh, preparing us and so that we can uh, still bring you this class on this morning. Uh, so wherever you are, uh, we appreciate you. We're thankful for you. We, we miss you, uh, especially our members. We miss you very much. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hugging you. Uh, you see this? Uh, I'm hugging you. And so <laughs> just letting you know how much we love and appreciate you. Uh, we are talking about uh, God receives his people. Uh, this is the third uh, class uh, in in. Uh, this is the third class that we are doing. We started off with God leads his people. And now we're talking about God delivers. Then we went to God delivers his people. And now we're talking about God receives his people. Now, the thing about the thing about this is that we, we're, we're looking at the story of the prodigal son. God receives his people. And the reason this is so vitally important is because there are many people who have turned away from God. There are there's those who yet to come to God and there are those who have turned away from him. And we need people to understand that no matter how bad it gets and no matter how far you have gone, no matter how far you have sunken, uh, that God will receive you back. But we need to make sure that we get up and get ourselves back on track and turn back to the true and living God. And God will receive us back. So if you are in a situation where you are trying to find your way back to God, just know that there's a loving God in heaven who wants you to return. And no matter what, he will receive you back. That story of the prodigal son is a great story for us to understand and appreciate so that we can, we can know that no matter what is our situation, uh, uh, we have the confidence in God that he, is, that he will accept us. And so this is what we're talking about. So turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. Uh, Luke chapter 15. I do have a PowerPoint for you that, I, that Craig will put on the screen here in a little bit so you can see the outline. Uh, there it is. Uh, Luke chapter 15. Uh, we are showing the very components uh, of repentance, the, the things that you need to be able to turn back to God. Now, at the outset of this parable, uh, this story that is told by Jesus, in, in the very first couple of verses, we find that Jesus is with sinners and he's with those who are considered the refuse of society. And the scribes and the Pharisees who considered themselves to be the elite of society and the religious leaders thereof, uh, those individuals were having a problem with Jesus and complaining that he receiveth sinners. And we're thankful to God that he does because the Bible declares that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so as a result of that, we're thankful that Jesus does receive sinners because we ourselves have, have been sinners and, and we certainly have made mistakes and we're thankful that God receives us uh, if we will turn to him, turn back to him and, and make things right. And so he receives sinners. And so the story is told about the lost sheep, the lost coin, and eventually verse number 11, beginning the lost boy. We looked on last week that what you need to do is to come to a recognition and, 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 and to have um, not only recognition, but regret to uh, make a resolution and then move toward reformation. And that's about where we stopped. We stopped uh, with resolution where the boy said, I will arise. And then we got to, we, we want to start this morning at reformation, reformation. Luke 15 and verse number 20, he said, the Bible says, and he arose and went to his father. You know, now he didn't just come to a recognition but he resolved to do something about his situation. 
And, 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 and so as I thought about this, I wanted to tell you some things that this boy did not do. Number one, he did not join a self-help group. Didn't join a self-help group as he came to this recognition and decided to do something about his situation. He did not seek to repair his inner child. He did not blame his friends, his boss, co-workers, or the pigs even. He didn't blame the hogs and all those kind of things. He, he didn't blame it on his upbringing. What he did was he came to himself. He made a decision about himself. You know how difficult it is to get people to see themselves, to get people to hone in on themselves, to get people to come to a recognition about themselves. You know how difficult it is to keep people from trying to justify themselves, even when they know their actions are not Christ-like, their actions are not conducive for Christianity even when they know they are doing the wrong thing, do you know how difficult it is to get someone to come to a recognition about themselves? What this boy did was he came to that recognition, he was ready to reform himself, and so what he did was, instead of going through all of these other avenues, he picked himself up, picked up himself, dusted himself off, and said, I am going home to my father. Now, it's one thing to say that. It's another thing, though, to follow through on what he had decided. You know, you think about it. When it comes to God, my friends, you can't almost turn to him. You can't almost return to him. Almost is not good enough when it comes to our returning or turning over to God. You know, if this boy does not get out of that pig pen and go home, everything's in vain. You, 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 you recognize that when this boy makes, comes to this recognition and while he's in this pig's pen, or rather he is coming to this recognition while he is in this pig's pen, that's when he's coming to the recognition. That's when he's making his resolution. That's when he has this remorse and this regret while he is in the pig's pen. The thing is, it's one thing to come to the recognition. It's one thing to acknowledge your situation and to come to grips with where you are. It's another thing entirely, though, to get out of that pig's pen and follow through on your recognition, on the acknowledgement that you are in a bad, terrible situation. He has to follow through. If he does not get out of that pig's pen and go home, then all that he did up to that point would be in vain. Think about a man named Felix. Now, Felix is in your Bible in Acts chapter 24 and verse number 25 as he is listening to Paul and Paul is preaching a sermon to Felix that is directly, <laughs> that has direct connections to him that actually, that actually is a sermon. We, not, we might almost say, you know how sometimes people like to say about preachers, you were preaching directly to me or, or, or you were meddling or, or, you know, sometimes you feel like if you tell a preacher something and the next thing you know, at least you feel this way, that he's preaching the very thing you told him and you feel like, wow, he did that toward me. Well, we might say that what Paul did was had a sermon tailor-made for Felix, tailor-made for him. And so in Acts 24 and verse number 25, the Bible says, and as he reasoned with him of righteousness and temperance and judgment to come, Felix here in that sermon, the Bible says, and Felix trembled and said, go your way, Paul, for this time when I have a more convenient season, I will call for you. So he had a sermon tailor-made for Felix. You know, and sometimes if we have a sermon tailor-made for you, you think that we were meddling with you. You think that we were messing with you. But sometimes, my friends, it is good to know that the word of God comes to you directly as if you're the only one in the room so that you can take inventory of yourself and decide to do something about your situation. So rather than worrying about whether or not the preacher had something to say about you or the sermon was aimed directly at you, chances are most preachers don't spend time making sermons thinking about you in that way, but I know sometimes people feel that way. But even if you feel that way, isn't it good to know that if that word of God spoke directly to you, it manifested to you your situation and you have the opportunity to do something about it? 
Well, that's a wonderful thing indeed. And certainly that was the situation with Felix. We might say because he trembled, he was almost, almost, because his emotions were stirred in him to that degree that the Bible says he trembled. When the last time you trembled at hearing the word of God? Oh, chances are maybe we have never trembled. Maybe we've never known uh, um, that kind of emotional content in listening to the word of God. But I'm sure that there are times when maybe you've heard something in the preaching of the word of God and you've cried. It evoked an emotion of you such as crying. Maybe there's times when you have laughed or, or you felt good or happy and you were emotionally connected to what you heard or what you read. So I'm sure there's time when the word of God gets us emotionally. Well, just imagine that. It got Felix, got to him. The man was, knees were shaking together and he was afraid. He was, he was terrified, literally terrified at what he heard, made him tremble. We might say he was almost, he was close. But you know what? You can't get close when it comes to your return to God. You've got to go all the way, or my friend, it's in vain. Even though he trembled, James tells us the devils also believe and tremble. They tremble, but not good enough. Felix may have gotten close, but he needed to go all the way. You consider Pilate, one who recognized Jesus' innocence, washed his hands because he felt that he was not going to be a part of this angry mob who was going to put to death an innocent person. And we might say, boy, he was close because he, he literally washed his hands and says, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. Matthew 27, verse number 24. What was Pilate doing? Well, this was a practice of the Jews to prove their innocence. In fact, if you look at certain scriptures, if you have your Bibles, look at Psalm 26. Craig, look, look with me, if you will, the Psalm chapter 26. And, and, and notice, we'll notice Psalm 26, verse number 25 and verse number 26. And then we'll notice another passage, especially if you're writing notes, Deuteronomy chapter 21 and verse number six. Now in Psalm 26, verse number 25 and verse number 26, listen to what the Bible says as Brother Craig reads it. I have hated the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. I will wash my hands in innocence, so I will go about your altar, O Lord, that I will proclaim with the voice of thanksgiving. Notice he says, I will wash my hands with innocence. See, this is what Pilate was doing. This is what the Jews often did. They felt like this was symbolic. If they washed their hands, they were saying, I am not guilty. I am not responsible. I am not involved, you know. And so oftentimes people like to say, I didn't have anything to do with it. Well, that's the idea of washing your hands. I don't have anything to do with this. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 21. Deuteronomy chapter 21. And, 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 and we'll go to verse number six when you get there. Deuteronomy 21 and verse number six. Washing that hands was a, was a symbolic way of saying, hey, I, I, I'm, I'm innocent. I'm innocent. Go ahead and read. And all the elders of that city nearest to the, to the slain man shall wash their hands over the heifer whose neck was broken in the valley. Then they shall answer and say, our hands have not shed this blood nor have our eyes seen it. Now, what's the idea and what's the point of the washing of the hands? Well, literally, the hands are the instruments of action. And by washing them, one is claiming that he is pure, that I am not responsible in any way. I did not participate in this action because since we do things with our hands and our hands are the instrument of actions, you can see then the symbolism as I wash my hands, I am saying that I didn't utilize my hands. I didn't have anything to do with this situation. I didn't participate with the wicked. And so therefore by washing my hands, and he literally took a basin before the crowd who would have understood exactly what he was doing, especially as God had told the 
priest Aaron and his sons and the event how to go in and the first thing one of the things they were to do as they were getting consecrated was they had to wash their hands they had to wash their feet and so this idea comes from that and you see throughout scripture they say wash our hands in innocence we didn't have anything to do with that man that man was that man was murdered we didn't have anything to do with it or or, or the wicked participating in that washing my hands i didn't have anything to do with it you know what's interesting is that even with us sometimes we'll say things like i washed my hands of that situation i i, I don't wash my hands of that individual I, what are we saying you know what we might be saying in that instance that you know i don't have anything else to do with that uh, um, i tried everything i could and and and, and so uh, i couldn't get the person to listen or or i went with them as far as i could but but they just they were just bent on doing it and going going in their own, their own direction they were they, they were consistent in what they were doing they would not be talked down and you know what just washed my hands of it well we say those kind of things as well and we understand what we mean by that well Pilate tried to wash his hands of this situation and claimed that he was pure and clean so you might say that Pilate was close boy he recognized Jesus was innocent and then even went before the crowd with some with symbolism that they would understand and says, I am pure from the blood of this just person. Well, was he? Hmm. Abimelech. Abimelech was another individual in the scripture. You find him in Genesis chapter 20. This is the king of Egypt when Abraham told him that Sarah was his sister. And because Abraham recognized that Sarah was a very beautiful woman, he told Abimelech that she is my sister because he feared that they would take her from him and they would even potentially put him to death. Well, Abraham then said, tell them that you are my sister. And upon finding out that was his sister, Abimelech took her and he was going to make her his wife. Now, with that in mind, look at what he says and as, he, as he explains himself and his actions uh, before God. Look at what he says in Genesis chapter 20 and verse number five, Brother Craig. We'll go to Genesis chapter 20 and, and verse number five. And, you know, and, and he was certainly, once again, saying something about innocence and his hands. How does it read? Genesis 20 and verse number five. But Abimelech had not come near her, and, the, and, and he said, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? Mm -hmm. Did he not stay, uh, say to me, she is my sister? And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hands have I done this. Notice what he says. He says, in the integrity of my heart and in the innocency of my hands have i done this what is he saying he's saying these hands <laughs> they are innocent and, and 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 not only that my heart my heart was right in this situation um I, I didn't i didn't take her by force i i didn't i didn't take her by violence i didn't violate her in any way i i, I was actually going to marry her you know and and so they didn't think poly polygamy and all those things were sins and so he thought he was doing right you know i, I you know he told me that was his, that was his sister I took her and I was going to take her as my wife. I was going to compensate the man fairly for all for, for, for his, for his wife. And, and so in the innocency of my hands, I, I didn't, I didn't do anything ill. I wasn't planning anything violent or anything like that. And um, he was saying that he was free. He was innocent. Well, go back to Pilate then. Pilate was a magistrate. It was his responsibility to try the Lord. And upon trying him, he then declared that he was innocent. He tried to say, I'm washing my hands of this just person, of, this, of the blood of this just person. I'm not going to have anything to do with it. But he had a whole lot to do with it because it was his responsibility to free, set free that innocent man. So though it might look like, oh boy, he's close, but if he truly wanted to be righteous and come all the way to God, 
He should have recognized who that was. And not only that, he should have done the right thing and freed that innocent man. Almost. That boy is in that pig's pen. And he has come to a recognition. He's regretted his situation and what he's done. And now he's making a reformation. He is saying, I'm getting up from here. and I'm going to my father. But boy, you got to finish. You got to do it. You got to follow through. There's a whole lot of folks that are always talking about what they are going to do, especially as it pertains to God, especially as it pertains to spiritual things. How many times have you heard people say, I'm going to get myself together? Well, when? It just doesn't seem like uh, uh, today is a good day. It always seems like it's in some distant part of the future. You know, you're going to see me. I'm coming. I'm going to get there. You know, I'm going to get baptized one day, maybe next week. Next time, I'm, it's always those kind of things. And they continue in the pig's pen of life while they are making those reformations or they're making those statements in reference to what they are going to do and accomplish, but they just don't do it. They don't follow through. Almost. They tell me, especially when you're talking about horseshoes, they say almost or close only counts in horseshoes and all those kind of things. Well, almost is not good enough. You consider someone like the rich ruler who went to Jesus and asked him a question. Look in your Bibles at Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. And when you get to Mark chapter 10, let's notice verse number 21. Mark chapter 10 and verse number 21. Consider the rich ruler who, who, who went away, who went away with one thing. We might say, boy, he's close. He's close. He came to the right person. Did he come to the Lord and master? He certainly did. He recognized who Jesus was. God and called him good teacher, master. He not only that, he came with and asked the right question. What thing must I do to inherit eternal life. We might say today, what must I do to be saved? What a great question. So he said, what must I do that I might inherit eternal life? And look at Mark chapter 10, Craig. Read verse number 21. And after he justifies himself and all those things, notice what Jesus says to him. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lacked, go your way. Sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross and follow me. You can just see how this works for some people. Just like in this story. The boy asked Jesus, what lack I yet? Jesus told him the one thing he lacked. Now, isn't that what he asked? What lack I yet? I've done all these things that you enumerated. I've done all those things from my youth. What lack I yet? What do you want, young man? I want eternal life. So what lack I yet? All the things you enumerated, I've done it. What lack I yet? Jesus told him. Jesus told him. One thing. One thing. That's what you lack. Were you ready for that answer? Did you really want to hear the answer to your question? Well, we find that when Jesus told him what the one thing he lacked was so close, so close, he went away sorrowful. You need to come to yourself. This is, in fact, this is why. This is why you need to come to yourself and do something about it. Do something about your situation. Do something about yourself. It doesn't matter who tells you if you don't want to, if you don't want to follow through. It doesn't matter who tells you something if you don't want to do it or if you don't consider that to be true about yourself. It doesn't matter, which is exactly and precisely why you have to come to an understanding and a recognition for yourself. A person can tell you till, they're, till they are blue in the face that, you've got, that you have a problem. But until you agree 
that you have a problem, nothing is going to change. And you know, the sad thing is some people come to that recognition, but they stop short of what they need to do. Thankfully, this boy didn't, but some people do. Pilate recognized it. It made him wash his hands, but he didn't go far enough. Felix recognized it. It made him tremble, but he didn't do anything about it. He didn't go far enough. Agrippa even said to Paul, Acts 26, 28, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Paul said, I would that you were not almost, but altogether. Everyone here, such as I, except these bonds. I wish you were all together such as I am. Almost just not good enough. You got to go further. Question, what have you recognized about yourself? What is it? What have you recognized about yourself? What have people told you about you? Think about some of those discussions you've had with people who know you very well. Discussions that you've had with maybe a parent who said some tough things to you about you. Think about some times maybe you've had a discussion with, some, with a sibling who told you some things, maybe even in an angry fashion, but it may have been the truth. What did they tell you about you? Think about how many times different people have told you things about you. They don't even know each other, yet they agree about something about you. Think about friends, close friends, people who know you very well. And what have they said about you, your attitude, things that you have done or things that you consistently do? What have they said? And what are you willing to do? Have you recognized it in yourself? And what are you willing to do about it? You see, this is about reformation. This is about not only coming to a recognition, because if you don't come to a recognition, you certainly can't get to a reformation. To be able to regret and to move to change. What have you recognized about yourself and what are you willing to do about it? Some regret. Some will recognize, stop short. Some regret and stop short. Did Judas recognize what he had done? Oh, certainly he did. He recognized what he had done. He recognized that he had betrayed innocent blood. He certainly did come to that recognition. Did he resolve to do something about it? He certainly did change his mind. What did he do? He had gone and he had covenanted with those, with the high priest and, and, and those, those Jews. He had covenanted with them for 30 pieces of silver. And then delivered them and delivered Jesus into their hands and then turned again and regretted the situation, had great remorse, and then changed his mind, went back and said he was returning the silver. But then he went and hung himself and went to his own place rather than returning back to God. It is one thing to change your mind about something. It is something entirely different to change your actions. Your mind should lead the actions. If you change your mind, my friends, your actions should follow. But we can also see that sometimes people change their mind about something through regret, but then don't follow through in the righteous manner, in a righteous manner. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 10, the Bible says, for godly sorrow worketh repentance, unto, worketh repentance unto death, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. And so that godly sorrow, sometimes, in fact, I probably didn't quote that correctly. Let's get that right, Craig. Second Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 10. I, I know I misquoted that. For, for uh, godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, mm -hmm. not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Thank you, thank you. Wanted to make sure we get that right. And, and, and so, so that godly sorrow is that, kind, that, that, that godly sorrow that will move one to change, to turn, to reform. That godly sorrow that will not allow one to regret their situation, having recognized their, their plight and their situation and sin, and then reforming themselves to turn around and do something about it. Well, that's godly sorrow, but the sorrow of the world is what Judas had. The sorrow of the world, the Bible says, worketh death. 
Mm. Work is death. Judas regretted, but then went and hung himself. This boy finally said, I'm going home. He arose, went home. You know why he arose and went home? Why do you think he arose and went home? I'll tell you why. In fact, I just thought of this. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. I'll tell you why this boy went home. But first, let's read this passage. 1 Peter chapter 4. Look at, look at verse number, we'll look at verse number 1 through 3. 1 Peter chapter 4. Verses one through three, and uh, we'll see. We'll see why this boy, why this boy went home. And, and, and you know what? Everyone needs to get to this. Need to get to this point. If you are, if you find yourself out there, and you find yourself needing to turn back to God, you need to get. You need to get to this point. First Peter chapter four, three verses one through three. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us, have for Christ suffered for us in the flesh. Arm yourself also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, mm -hmm. that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. Now watch this. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking, partying and parties and abominable idolatries. You know why this boy went home? It was time. He had had enough. He'd had enough. We sometimes say to people who are just still out there, in fact, you have probably seen it, as we, as we grew up and sometimes we didn't always do things that were right, sometimes we went to places maybe it wasn't good for us to be in certain places and things like that. You know, you, you, you think about people who have a nightlife, you know, they're out there in the nightclubs and, and doing all this, the Bible talking about this, all this lewdness and lasciviousness and all that stuff that plays itself out in, in those night spots and those nightclubs and, and, and people out there doing all kinds of things that certainly are not Christian uh, um, things, nor, nor active, no Christian things, no activities or, 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 or Christian activities of any sort. You, you see people doing those kind of things. And, and, and maybe at one point in time, you or, or, or we participated in some of those things as we were growing up. And then eventually you got to the point where you looked up and you said to yourself, you know what, I need to turn this way. And you turn to the Lord and sometimes people will turn that way, even just getting older, just getting wiser, and just saying, I've had enough of that scene, of that situation. And, and, and sometimes we look at people and, and they are 40, 50, 60 years old, and they're still out there doing the same thing. And you marvel, you marvel. And what we would say to them is, haven't you had enough? Aren't you tired? of this stuff? Aren't you tired of living this way? Aren't you tired of doing the same old things? We see now in this, in this whole nightclub type lifestyle, you see now mothers and fathers out there with their children. Sometimes three generations are out there and you're like, wow, wow. At some point, Maybe you ought to recognize that it's just time to go home. It's just time to quit. It's just time to give it up. It's just time to stop. Time to do something different. And I'll tell you what, the best thing you can do is turn to the Lord. Turn to the Lord. And so the time of our life may, may have sufficed when we wrought the will of the Gentiles and lasciviousness and banquetings and rioting and all those kind of things, maybe it should get to the point where you've had enough and enough is enough. That boy had enough. That's why he went home. He had enough. He saw what the world had to offer him. He saw what that far country of sin had to offer him. Haven't you? You haven't seen it yet? Sometimes even members of the Lord's church, our young people who ran out, and went out into that world. You haven't had enough? You haven't seen it yet? 
You don't know that it's not all it's cracked up to be yet? That boy went home because it was time. It was time for him to leave the far country. It was time. It was time for him to leave those evil associations. You know, in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse number 33, Paul says, be not deceived and the you is understood. Don't deceive yourself. Be not deceived. Evil communications or evil associations, corrupt good manners or corrupt good morals, depending on which version you have. So evil associations, corrupt good morals. Did we learn that? We certainly did while we were growing up and while we came up in this world, we understood that. Oftentimes I would tell people in reference to myself, I was not one of those children or one of those kids or one of those young people that went out looking for trouble, but I had the kind of friends that would find some. And oftentimes if they found trouble, guess what? Because of my association with them, I ended up finding the same trouble. Well, you know what? I got tired of finding someone else's trouble and I decided to do something else. Well, be not deceived. Evil communication, corrupt good manners, corrupt good morals. It was time for that boy to leave that far country of sin. He had enough. When is it time to make a change? Well, whenever you come to that recognition, Time to make a change because it's going to take you coming to that recognition in order for that change to take place. But when it is time to make a change, you make sure that you don't confer with flesh and blood. Make sure you don't confer with flesh and blood when it's time to make that change. Because you know what flesh and blood will do? They'll try to keep you where you are. They'll try to keep you where you are. I recall um, many of you who know me know that um, I played basketball and, and um, that was uh, one of the things that I did. One of the things I really, I really enjoyed doing and, and, and I did it on a pretty good level. And, and so we used to travel and we used to play basketball in tournaments everywhere. We would go anywhere and everywhere. If there was a basketball tournament, we had a traveling team and we would go play in all these men open basketball tournaments in different states. And, and, um, and we would win a lot of those tournaments. And we would play against some, some, some really good, good stiff competition. Some were NBA players, some were overseas players, some was collegiate players, and they would put their teams together, especially in the summer times, and we would have a chance to compete against these guys. Well, we had a good thing going because we were known and we had a great team. One day we were on our way back from a tournament playing in the Dust Bowl, I believe it was, in, in Indianapolis, Indiana. And uh, we were all in this, in this van and I knew that I was about to make a change. And I hadn't told the guys yet, but on this particular occasion, I thought it's, good, it's a good time to tell them. So I said, gentlemen, I said, I want you all to know this is my last tournament. They said, what are you talking about? I said, man, I'm going to the Memphis School of Preaching to become a gospel preacher. And so this will be the last time I'm able to go out and play with you guys. So I didn't want to tell you all because I didn't want to mess you up before the game. But I'm letting you know, listen, those guys start yelling <laughs> and they were telling me, you don't need to do this. You all right. You a good person already. Yo, don't do this, man. Don't mess up what we, in other words, I conferred with flesh and blood and flesh and blood was trying to talk. You would think that people are, oh man, that's a great and wonderful and noble thing that you're doing. Oh man, I know you're going to be good and you're going to be great and all these kinds of things. No, they were trying to talk me out of it. Don't mess up what we have going. We've been winning all these tournaments. You are our point guard and we're not going to be able to do this without you. And so they tried their best to talk me down. When you need to make that change in your life, don't confer with flesh and blood. No, I'll tell you what you do. Because see, flesh and blood will discourage you. 
Do you not know when you make a lifestyle change like that, you're going to impact the life of those people who've been associating with you? And so oftentimes, even though you're making a good change, that good change that you're making for you is going to impact them and they're not ready to make that change. So guess what they don't want you to do? They don't want you to change as well. Don't listen to flesh and blood. I'll tell you what you listen to. Listen to that thing inside called your conscience. But only when it's been awakened by the word of God. You see, in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12, the Bible says, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit and of, joint, and of the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That word of God can go all the way into that dark region known as between your soul and spirit, get right in there, bring a light, open up, bring a light and expose a man to himself and make that man recognize himself as a sinner and say and declare, I have sinned, I'm in need of salvation. You see, only the word of God can do that and awaken a man's conscience. When you are in a situation and you come to a recognition because the right right things came to your mind because maybe the word of God came back to your heart. Maybe because someone told you what was right and finally it, it hits home for you. That light that opens up and wakens your conscience, that's what you listen to. And that's because the word of God is what woke it up. And when you then hear that, you see, that's what that boy heard. That boy was in that pig's pen. He didn't need somebody to come preach a sermon to him. It was already in him. He knew what he had learned at his father's house. Now it came back to him. When that word of God comes back to your heart, you know how you've been reared. You know, you know the truth. You've been reared up in the church. You know what's right. You know what's wrong. When that finally comes back to you, my friends, because the word of God has awakened that thing, you need to listen to that. Don't confer with flesh and blood. Get yourself up, dust yourself off, and head back to your father. Head back to the church. Head back to your family. Do what you need to do to get it right. My friends, if God can put a light in there when no lamp has gone before and expose a man to himself, so did he say I'm a sinner? Then you all thank God for that. You all thank God for that light. 